Our next presenter is Elizabeth Ellenwood. Elizabeth uses photography to explore and bring attention to critical environmental issues. Elizabeth is a recipient of a 2020-2021 U.S. Fulbright student, student Research Grant and an American Scandinavian grant to continue her work in Norway. Her recent solo exhibition at the Alexi von Schlippi Gallery was supported by a Connecticut Sea Grant Art Support Award and the University of Connecticut Sachs Award. She received a Dennis Russell Merit Award and her work was recently exhibited at the New York the Newport Art Museum, Panopticon Gallery in Boston, and the Vermont Center of Photography. Elizabeth received a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Photography from the New Hampshire Institute of Art and is a candidate for the MFA in Studio Art at the University of Connecticut. Please welcome Elizabeth Ellenwood. Thank you, Monica, and thank you all so much for being here today. I think this is the most amount of people either on the screen by their text or videos that I've seen in a really, really long time. So this is awesome. Thank you for being here. Um, thank you to my cohort. You all, you just, you rock. And that's all I can say without crying. So on that note, let's move on to presentation. In order to fully understand my work and its origins, I think it's important to share with you all where I have come from. I've loved the ocean for as long as I can remember. Growing up in Daytona Beach, Florida and Waterford, Connecticut, I didn't have to go far to find my happy place. Water was always right around the corner. There's a long lineage of boat people on my dad's side of the family. When I was five, my family lived on a sailboat and my sister and I were homeschooled. The bottom photo is me in my classroom. This is where I developed a love for the ocean and also a fear of barracudas, but that's a story for another time. My mom comes from an artistic family. So from a young age, I was encouraged to make things. The act of creating stuck with me through high school and sent me to pursue an undergraduate degree in photography. Fast forward a few decades, I still like making things. These images were made during my first year at UConn. Prior to graduate school, I worked professionally as a darkroom printer. When making traditional darkroom prints, you do everything in your power to not crease, crumple, bend, or in any way hurt the print. Needing to stretch my artistic legs, I did all of these actions to my darkroom paper and made cameraless images. I continued my crumpling habit into other photographic processes. Both of these examples are early handmade photographic processes, meaning I am mixing and hand coding chemistry to create the images. I use process to satisfy my curiosities, learn something new about my medium, and keep my hands in the workflow. While I like making things for the sake of making, Graduate school has focused my attention on connecting my photographic processes to my concepts. This is the aftermath of a late night fishing trip. The squid skin was still changing color the next day. I thought it odd and wanted to know more. The timing was perfect. In our special topics class focused on research-based artwork, we were reading Deborah Bright's case study in which she states, I begin, as artists often do, with a hunch, an intuition. My hunch was a bucket of dead squid. I read books, watched videos, researched cuisines, listened to music, looked at art, traced histories and locations, even bought a new shower curtain, all related to cephalopods. I learned that squid skin is made up of chromatophores, or pigment sacs, that expand and contract like a muscle. This helps with camouflage or distraction and is just one of the many cephalopod defense mechanisms. With the research checked off the list, 
I was faced with the challenge of making an image. Not having an actual squid in front of me, I turned to my computer, which emits light and visual information. I brought the computer displaying cephalopod documentaries into the darkroom, pressed a piece of light sensitive photo paper to the screen and made the exposure. The image on the left shows the chromatophores of a squid, while the image on the right is octopus skin. This project opened up a new way of working that mixed my skills in photography with my research interests and curiosities. I photographed anything I could that was cephalopod related. I made this image at a nature lab. I really enjoy spending time in, in natural history collections and specimen collections. I love the jars, the organization, the labels, and the preservation of items for future generations. Reading The Soul of the Octopus by Cy Montgomery had me fixated on meeting an octopus. I signed up for an internship at the Mystic Aquarium in hopes to befriend Neptune, the giant Pacific octopus. Every Wednesday, I was doing food prep, cleaning tanks, and feeding animals. But the one animal I desperately wanted to feed played hard to get. An octopus's suckers not only feel and function separately, they also have tasting sensors too. Neptune could taste the difference between me and her preferred aquarist through the water. After a persistent month of submerging my hands in the icy cold water of her tank, she approved and let me feed her. I told everyone that I blacked out from happiness that day. I now had a friend with eight arms, three hearts, and moves that would make Houdini jealous. Everything I was reading and watching about octopuses, I got to see and photographed firsthand through Neptune. I was gifted a molt of a baby horseshoe crab by one of the aquarists. The luminous and see-through casing made for an ideal photogram exploration. Going back to my roots of traditional darkroom printing, without creasing or crumpling, I made the silver gelatin print of the molt. My admiration and childhood curiosity for the ocean was creeping into my practice. Living close to the water again, I started going on beach walks. I'm gonna be completely honest with you all, and all my professors, please use your earmuffs now. I started going on these walks as an escape from school. I needed time and space to turn my brain off, let go of all the mounting questions of what I was making and why, and to simply just breathe. While I was on my walks, my intuition kicked in and I started picking up trash. This was something I did as a kid. I was always taught to leave it better than you found it. And when I was young, I happily participated without thinking too much about it. But as an adult, I really started to think about it. All of the trash I was finding on the beach were items I could relate to. Cups and straws from all the iced coffee I loved in the summer, chip bags that were enjoyed on the beach, plastic caps to water bottles, fishing lures snapped off from the ones that got away, even that pink jelly sandal I know that I had as a kid. Seeing these familiar objects, I began to recognize my responsibility as a consumer. The fact is, we all use these materials, and they're all ending up in places they don't belong. I started cataloging my collections. This image is only a fraction of what was collected from East Beach in Watch Hill, Rhode Island. This day, I collected 547 pieces of trash. Of that, 149 were unidentifiable plastic fragments. The action of cataloging the debris, spending time sifting and looking at each individual item, got me to see the marine debris issue through a new lens. Now aware of the problem, I couldn't turn away. I needed to find a way to share the information I was collecting. I started thinking about my skills and how I could use them as a tool. This is where my passion for the ocean and for art really began to intertwine. I looked to historical artwork for inspiration. 
Anna Atkins was a botanist and is considered to be the first female photographer. In 1843, Atkins was making beautiful cyanotype prints, recording algae and seaweed specimens. She made photograms by placing the plants directly on top of the sensitized paper to make her exposure. Just last year, the New York Public Library hosted an exhibition celebrating the life and work of Anna Atkins. Over a hundred years later, her prints are still in great condition and seeing the intricate details in her prints left a lasting impression on me. I also use the cyanotype process to create a visual log, but instead of using natural specimens like Atkins, I use the trash I pick up on the beach. Making photograms allows me to create work that is both visually engaging and factually descriptive of the debris. The cyanotype process transforms the objects into white silhouettes floating in a mass of blue as if still submerged in the sea. Referencing herbarium collections, I use labels to highlight the reality of the environmental crisis I am trying to expose. Sometimes I focus on specific items like plastic bags, which are relatable on a personal and global level. I saw an awareness grow from sharing these images on social media, and it made me want to push the idea of visual communication even more. November 3rd, 2018 is an installation of 240 photograms. Each print is made with an individual piece of trash collected from one beach walk. This work combines my collecting printing, and presentation to convey a story. It adds numbers and hard facts to visual experience and shares research in a physically compelling way. The accumulation of single discarded objects within the mass suggests that each choice we make as consumers affects the whole. The scale of the installation references the flood of trash in our oceans. While its details invite us to play a game of I spy, finding familiar items in the collection, we begin to recognize our personal relationship to the problem. Taking down the installation, I was left with this. I referred to the sculpture as my tape ball. Once gathered, I couldn't just throw the tape ball away. As you can probably tell by now, I like making and collecting things. So I drove the tape ball to North Carolina for a winter residency at Penland School of Crafts and memorialized the remnants using the wet plate process. Mark Dion gathered objects from the Connecticut shoreline and then arranged each as relics in his display. Dion explains that many of these cast-offs are attractive because they were originally designed to appeal to consumers. The bleached and mangled condition of these pollutants generates endless questions about their origins. Where did they come from? How long were they lost? Who did this debris belong to? Or could it have been mine? After seeing this exhibition, I was inspired to show the trash and environment from my beach walks. The term field notes refers to the observations of a researcher in the field. My field notes show digital photographs and geotags for every piece of trash before it is collected. The images reveal both the object and its surrounding environment, and the downward perspective refer references forensic evidence. Individually, each image captures a specific moment in time and together they form a story as they visually narrate my walk. The books show my research and recorded data, allowing insight to my process. I shared more of my beach walk process when my classmate Chad and I brought our studio practices together.
checking. Hello. We've got a really thin line of rope. Got it, thank you. So as seen in the video, we communicated with walkie talkies, with me describing the trash for Chad to draw. Some objects were harder for me to describe than others, and the whole experience forced me to be aware of the language that I was assigning to each item. Oh. Our results from the walk were displayed, displayed alongside the film. With different approaches to documenting and creating, Chad and I collaboratively formed artwork that invites viewers to consider communication in all its forms and its role in the ocean pollution crisis. Mission Blue is a documentary on the life and work of Dr. Sylvia Earle. She is an oceanographer, marine biologist, and environmentalist. The film follows Dr. Earle as she fights for ocean conservation. When I saw the footage of the coral reefs bleaching, the beautiful, vibrant ecosystems turning into anemic wastelands weighed heavy on my mind. I needed to make something to reference the critical situation of the reefs, and it was important to me to create in an environmentally friendly way. The anthotype process literally only uses plants, paper, a negative, and the sun. Using a red cabbage from my mom's garden, thank you mom, I juiced the plant and coated my paper. Depending on the plant used and the strength of the sun, the printing can take days, weeks, or even months. The anthotype print develops as the sunlight destroys the pigment of the exposed areas. The UV light is literally bleaching the print. The prints are not permanent and will fade over time. In the 19th century, anthotypes were stored in what were called night albums and only viewed with candlelight to help preserve the images. Fading Reefs is the series I created after watching Mission Blue. The content of coral reefs is tied tightly to the process of making the images. My anthotype prints are delicate, time sensitive, and beautiful, just like actual coral reefs. Another example of storytelling, and one that I revisit often, is the work of Chris Jordan. Although the subject matter is extremely disturbing, Jordan has captured deceased albatross birds in a compelling way, which allows for immediate understanding across all audiences. For me, when I look at his work, I can't help but think of the trash that I collect on local beaches. The bottle caps, the lighters, the plastic fragments, the trash is all the same. Talking about aesthetics in his photography, Jordan says, if it's too horrible, no one will want to look. It's a statement that rings true for my work as well. We are both searching for a balance of the beautiful within the devastation, a way to share visuals that are approachable and easily understood. But what about the pollutants that we don't see? Each week brings a new report about the discovery of plastic particles in our oceans, rivers, snow, and air. Yet how do we as the general public even begin to understand these teeny tiny pieces? For more information, I turn to Michaela Cashman, a PhD student at the University of Rhode Island studying microplastics in sediments. 
Visiting Michaela's lab opened my eyes to the importance of classifying and understanding the unrecognizable plastics. Finding the original identity of the minute plastics can help inform current policies and manufacturing. Michaela's research also influenced me to look closer at the grains of sand on my beach walks. Sure enough, splinters of plastics littered the ground, unrecognizable shapes were hiding in the sand and were easily missed. Mimicking the tools, materials, and labels I saw in the lab, I started my own research focused on the tiny trash. My collection follows a protocol. See a small plastic fragment, scoop the sand and native particles along with the fragment into a Petri dish, chart the latitude and longitude of the sample, and numerically label the sample. The series builds on the idea from the cyanotype installation of using individual photographs to create a massive index. My goal with my ongoing sand and plastic collection is to create visually engaging imagery with scientific materials to give viewers an entry point into microplastics research. Since starting my project, I have logged 39 beach walks, traveling a total of 35.79 miles while collecting 3,417 pieces of trash. While my photographic processes vary, the drive to create remains the same, to produce images that heighten awareness, provide new perspectives, and assist in the marine debris research being conducted today. As I leave graduate school, I am excited to have a direction for my work, and I will keep using research and science to inform my image making. I will continue to offer my skills to be a part of the momentum for change in my lifetime. And while I still have control over your screens, I want to point out that today is Earth Day, and it's actually the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. This website has more information and virtual events happening all day, so feel free to check it out. So let's celebrate our Earth. Let's go outside. Let's go for a walk. And in the words of my grandpa Mike, let's leave it better than we found it. Thank you.